some of the things that we've done around jobs, the great things. Labor will invest in our local businesses. We have a lot of self-funded retirees. Primary health care services aren't being properly funded. People are nervous about a change of government. Just 10 days out from the election, this is the Sky News Longman Debate. Now your host, Laura Jays. Hello and welcome to Caboolture. We are in the marginal seat of Longman and it loves to swing. It's held on a margin of just 3.3%. And this is a seat where retirees and pensioners meet with competing interests for mortgage holders. And then you've got to look at the rural fringe. This is also a seat that really propelled the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, into the leadership. It gaveth and it could very much taketh away in just... 10 days time that is why this seat is the last in our battleground series and these are the rules of today's debate 45 minutes of fierce debate competing uh, policy areas and a contest of ideas there are no prepared notes there is a 30 second opening statement a 30 second closing statement and in between we get right into it so terry young is the lnp member and and Rebecca Fanning, the Labor candidate, wanting to take this seat from him. Welcome to you both. You know the rules. Terry, you have the first 30 seconds. Well, thanks, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my name's Terry Young, and I'm the federal member for Longman. And three years ago, the people of this great community entrusted me to look after them and, and also to represent them in Canberra. And it's a great honour. And I'm a, I'm a dad, and I'm a husband, and I'm a granddad. And before politics, I never worked in government or in a political office. I came from the private sector and I wanted to bring some common sense to politics and leave all the backstabbing and all the bitching and all the whinging out of it. I don't want to take down my opponents. I just want to stay honest and serve my community. Rebecca. Thanks, Laura. Well, I'm a Caboolture local who grew up in the outer northern suburbs of Brisbane. My dad ran a small business and my mum taught at the local TAFE. With a background in health policy, I know just how much our community has been let down by Scott Morrison. Locals are telling me how it is so hard to see a doctor, that everything is going up except their wages and that the aged care system is in crisis. Our community deserves better. Well, let's start with what your constituents, voters, have told us what they want to hear from you today and hopefully we can get some answers. Have a look. In terms of our payment as a pensioner, when will be it will uh, rise up in line with the inflation? Because as a pensioner, we all rely on our money. The one that would be on most people's minds would be the cost of living and how are they going to protect us from the cost of living hikes while our wages are stagnating. Our wages are not increasing, it's still staying the same uh, and our cost of living is increasing every day. And uh, normal people like us, you know, it's hard to meet the ends, especially when the interest rate goes up for the house. Uh, are they going to do anything to increase the wages? What they give us there, 250. 250 just recently, that's nothing. All right, Terry, they want a wage increase. Will your government deliver that? Well, as we all know, and the uh, opposition leader uh, testified to that a couple of days ago, is that the Fair Work Commission is one who determines wages, governments don't. However, there are levers that the government can, uh, can engage to make sure that people keep more of what they earn, and that's exactly what we've done. Someone on $60,000 a year, uh, compared to the last time Labor were in, is now $3,500 better off in their back pocket. That's what matters, what people take home. Uh, and with our new initiative where we've implemented uh, $1,500 worth of extra tax relief to the people of, of Longman and Australia, uh, that's going to be a welcome relief to all those people as the well. The Prime Minister said today, though, that essentially the economy can't afford people on a minimum wage in your electorate to get an extra dollar an hour. Well, as I say, a dollar an hour is the gross wage, but what matters is the net wage. And by having these tax breaks and these tax reliefs, that will translate into more than a dollar in their pay that they take home, which is well, what matters. Okay, Rebecca, what do you have to say to that? And would a Labor government actually be able to deliver this without pushing rates higher? Well, I've heard from so many locals all across our region about the fact that cost of living are skyrocketing while real wages are going backwards. And we know this isn't an accident under the LNP. This LNP government has said 
that low wages growth is a deliberate design feature of their economic strategy and is only Labor that has a plan to deliver more good, secure, well-paid jobs. But how and are you going to do that? Because we've heard all these lines before with respect. How will Labor actually deliver a wage increase? Well, Labor will deliver more good, secure local jobs and our plan has a number of elements. Mm -hmm. One is our National Reconstruction Fund, which is about co-investing with business when they have good ideas for new projects that will create more job opportunities for locals and also create more opportunities for local apprentices. We also have our Buy Australian plan, which is about using the tremendous purchasing power of the federal government to make sure that wherever possible, we're backing Aussie businesses and creating more local jobs. Sure, but how is that all going to help, you know, people on the minimum wage in 11 days time? Well, Labor supports wages keeping up with the cost of living. That shouldn't be a controversial view. Yet we've heard from Scott Morrison that he does not support that. And that is why we are seeing real wages go backwards under the Morrison government. Okay, you know the figures. Where should it be at? Where should the minimum wage go to? Well, Labor supports wages keeping up with the increasing cost of living. Yeah. Because if wages aren't keeping up with cost of living, then that means workers are going backwards and things are getting harder and harder for working families in our region. Household budgets are really feeling the pain mm. of the fact that the cost of everything is going through the roof. Petrol prices, gross grocery prices, childcare, healthcare costs, power bills. Everything mm -hmm. is going up except their wages. All right, Terry, small businesses, can they afford it? to give it a pay rise to their workers well, again, and should that, they be that, doing it? That's the challenge for the Fair Work Commission. The Fair Work Commission has to get the balance right because well, we Why want... do small business need the Fair Work Commission to tell them what to pay their workers? If they're doing well, should they be passing on that to their, to their employees? And I'm sure most small businesses are. I know myself, I've been a small business owner for 20 years. Is that happening in this electorate, do you think? Yes. Where? Absolutely. When I've talked to different employers, they have commission schemes, they have bonus schemes, so they incentivise their workers. That absolutely happens. And I can say personally for myself that, you know, when we had good years in business, I rewarded my workers. And most small business owners have that attitude, that they want their workers to share in the success of their business. Yep. It drives great um, worker morale, and it's a good thing. That's already happening. Do you agree, Rebecca? Well, I have the utmost respect for small business owners. Uh, my dad was a small business owner and I saw how hard he worked and how he created mm. jobs for locals in his community at, at his shop. But I think the federal government can be doing more to help small businesses and we've announced our plan to help small businesses. And we can also really help businesses in our region by making sure they can get the skilled workers they need. Because that is an issue that actually lots of businesses are struggling with and that's why Labor has our plan okay. for fee-free TAFE and more university places to deal with those industries where there are skill shortages across the Where economy. do you get those skills work, skilled workers from? Because when you're talking about reskilling and upskilling, that's a pipeline. That takes years to do. And also, Caboolture, where we are right now, has a higher unemployment rate than the national average. Why is that? And can you fix those two issues? Are they related? Well, part of it is about giving more people the skills they need. And that's why Labor's fee-free TAFE plan is so important. It will cr provide 465,000 fee-free TAFE places. That doesn't help these businesses tomorrow. So what is your plan? Well, we need a plan for the long term. So what we've seen... And under the, the short term with respect. Well, we have, Do you have no a short term plan. plan? We have no plan under the Morrison government. Right now, all they have is a plan to get through the election. Labor has a medium and long-term plan to grow the economy, to help people get the skills they need. And this is an issue, you know, across the care economy, with us needing more nurses and aged care workers and childcare workers. You're giving us a medium to long-term plan, though. What's the short-term plan? I mean, no one wants to talk about overseas migration. Is that part of your thinking here, to alleviate that pressure? Well, take the aged care sector, which is one sector where mm. we're seeing skill shortages. So part of what can help fix this problem is to make sure that workers are getting a decent wage and they're working in a sector where their skills are valued. So where do these workers come from? Where are you attracting them from? Other industries? Well, I talk to lots of people when I've been door knocking. I've door knocked on thousands of homes. And I'm often talking to people who are workers in the aged care sector right now. And I'm often hearing from people who used to work in the aged care sector, but they left because the, the wages they were getting just weren't 
fair given mm. the skilled, emotional, difficult work they do and also the issues with job insecurity where people often weren't guaranteed more than eight hours of work on their contracts and they were continually reliant on their employers every week deciding to give them more hours. So these people loved working in the aged care sector but given the financial instability and the impact it had on their families, they couldn't stay mm. and they left to go do other jobs, you know, often working in warehouses. So I've talked to both aged care workers and nurses sure. who reluctantly left the sector and I know that if they got the wage increase they deserved and with Labor's plan to fix the crisis in aged care, they would want to come back because I know they really missed working and helping elderly right. Australians. Terry, maybe we'll get an answer from you. Where do these workers come from in the short term? OK, so uh, let's look at some numbers. So uh, last time, when I was, uh, sorry, when, when Labor were last in in 2013, the unemployment rate in Longman was 7.4%. The um, national average at that time was 5.7%. Mm. Now it's 5.1% here and it's 4% 4, 4, 4 nationally. So that means we've narrowed the gap substantially. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, people are finding out what a great community this is to open a business, whether it be manufacturing, whether it be farming, it doesn't matter, people are coming to this area. because What are the, the, sector, what are the growing sectors? The growing sectors are farming, manufacturing, mm. are construction, absolutely. So they, all those industries, now we've backed that up by paying 50% of the, of, the year, of the first year apprentices wages, and that's meant another 1,900 apprentices have started in Longman in the last 12 months, which has got to be good news. We've also taken steps. In the last two weeks, I've announced $4 million worth of funding for a safer communities program, which helps at-risk youth get back on their feet and get them job ready. That's how we get people here. The other thing that we did a couple of years ago is we changed the university funding uh, so that Jobs are in demand, such as doctors, such as nurses, engineers, all those things. They now receive more government funding than they used to, and we've reduced the funding. The overall funding has gone up, but we've reduced the funding on, on those, um, those vocations that don't have demand. So what we've seen is a 128% increase in uh, university uptake of those jobs that are in demand. Yeah. So that was two years ago, so we'll start to see the benefit of those in two years. We are also talking about, as we know, it's been difficult to get people in from overseas during COVID. That's been a challenge. Yep. But now the borders are opening back up. Absolutely. Skilled immigration is going to be one What's, of the Where's the pillars. incentive, though? To come here? Yeah. Well, the well, incentive is it's a great place to live for a start. So I talked to so many people who have come from overseas, from Europe and from England, and, and they've had a much worse experience in COVID than we did, thanks to the, the management of, of the government here. And, you know, Which government? Well, <laughs> federally, um, we can say that we, uh, the Prime Minister at the start called the pandemic two weeks before the WHO and, was, and actually closed the borders to Wuhan, and, that, mm. and I think that saved a lot of lives right there. So... The state governments have had their place to play. And look, as a federal member, I don't think it's my place and I need to respect okay. the constitution to criticise or to evaluate how, what state governments have done. Our main response was the financial side of it. We have saved so many jobs through JobKeeper. Uh, that initiative there, when, I was, when I'm out talking to local businesses, mm. they're saying without JobKeeper, we would have shut our doors. So we have done plenty yep. to make sure that, the, that the, the employment rate here has dropped and it's getting closer and closer to the national average. And my goal is to get it below that no national average if I'm really... All right, Rebecca, let's talk about the pandemic. Did the Palaszczuk government get it right? Well, the Palaszczuk government, it was only because of the tough decisions they took, like to close the borders, that Queensland did so well during the pandemic. If Anastasia Palaszczuk hadn't taken that tough decision to close the state border, then we would have seen the same sort of lockdowns in Queensland that we unfortunately saw in New South Wales and Victoria. And what we saw throughout the pandemic was that Scott Morrison never took responsibility and was always just wanting to play politics. Mm. He and his ministers attacked Anastasia Palaszczuk for the tough decision that she took on borders. So even you're, though you're that a health policy advisor, right? You were advising the Palaszczuk government to do exactly what they did? Is that right? Well, what was so important What was about... your role? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so my role was uh, I worked for the state government and I was there throughout the, co the first year of the COVID pandemic. And what Anastasia Palaszczuk got right was she listened to the health experts. Mm. She listened to what they had to say and she took action. Whereas what we saw from Scott Morrison was he failed to take action and it was everyday Australians who kept paying the price for his failures, whether it was on quarantine, whether it was the vaccine rollout, mm. whether it was his failure to secure enough rapid antigen tests. Every time he failed, 
It was everyday people like the ones who live in our community here yeah. in Longman who paid the price. So were you advising the Palaszczuk government to do that, close the borders, lock people out from seeing their families, leave children stranded on the other side of the border? Is, is, did you endorse that? So I was part of the team that was working with the state government. But the important thing about Anastasia Palaszczuk was she listened to the health experts, mm. like the chief health officer. And I think that's what's so important. I'm a was health... there enough compassion? We're in retrospect now. It's easy to look at things in hindsight. When you look at this, was there enough compassion shown during the crisis? It was only because Anastasia Palaszczuk... But that's not my question. I don't need a line. Was there enough compassion shown? Yes, because if you'll let me answer your question, it was only because Anastasia Palaszczuk took those tough decisions on the border that we avoided the lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria that cost people their lives, cost people their livelihoods and means businesses had to shut. So Anastasia Palaszczuk took the tough decisions to protect Queenslanders and protect communities like ours here and whereas in contrast, all we saw from Scott Morrison is that he would never take responsibility and his failures to listen to the experts and act on the warnings is what meant uh, we had the issues with the vaccine rollout and the yeah. lack of rapid antigen But even tests. in retrospect, you can't see that perhaps you didn't get things right? I see that in our community here, our businesses were open and operating and people were getting to live their lives normally as people in New South Wales and Victoria were locked in their Well, and your fellow New South Welshman couldn't say goodbye to a dying parent that happened to be in Queensland. Is, are you OK with that? It's these tough decisions, listening to the health experts, that saved people's lives, that prevented more funerals happening in Queensland. Mm. OK, let's uh, talk about... GPs and the access that I don't think your constituents are happy about getting or not getting. What's the solution here, Terry? We haven't heard a lot during this campaign. Well, that's because um, that's something I've been working on for a couple of years and, and those issues are, are already solved. Um, They're solved? Yes. So, so there's no wait times for GPs. People can get access to emergency help when they need it. Right. So what's happened is over the last couple of years, uh, there's something called a DPA status, and that enables communities who have a high need for GPs to be able to access overseas trained doctors. If you don't have that DPA status, then you're not able to access those, so that reduces your pool, which causes a shortage. Hmm. Uh, I was a bit perturbed by the fact that we didn't have that. We actually had it until 2016, and then we lost it. Uh, it's assessed independently by government, by the health department, and they rate different communities during, over the state and over the country. And I was perplexed and said, well, that's not what I'm seeing on the ground. So I lobbied the, um, the health minister at the time, and he, went, he, to his credit, he went through the PHN and they revised the numbers, because I believe that the numbers that they were using were too old, and it turns out that I was right. And we got our DPA status back uh, in January this year, right. and for Bribey Island, and Ningi, and for Beechmere, and in March we got it back for Morayfield, Caboolture, Woodford, Weemaran. So all those areas that applied for D DPA status exemption mm. got that. So now the doctors are actively recruiting. They've already filled some positions, and they say that they should have most of the positions filled by end of the financial year. Rebecca, is that Good the news. way you see it? Well, I'd just like to bring up a couple of issues here, but first I'd like to make the point that I have heard from so many locals all across our region, whether it's Bribey Island or Caboolture or Burpengarry or Woodford, who have to wait two or three weeks or longer for a GP appointment. So we have a GP crisis in our region. Is that standard? Well, I'd, I'd just like to also... Well, it certainly shouldn't be the standard, and it is absolutely not good enough. Mm. And I'd just but like I'm to just make trying to establish, are they outliers, or is that about the average people are waiting? That's the most common response I get from locals when I ask them about their experience with the health system and trying to get a GP appointment. Terry just said that our area lost DPA status. Our area didn't lose DPA status. This LNP government took it away. And this is what we have seen under nine years of this LNP government, their constant attacks on Medicare, whether it's the fact we now have a GP crisis, whether it's the fact mm. that they cut the Medicare rebates for more than 900 surgeries and diagnostic tests in the middle of a pandemic. And now to make matters even worse, in October last year, the urgent care clinic at the Morayfield Health Hub had to close because the Morrison government refused to provide it the funding it needs. And this was a really important local facility. Are they just federally funded, are they? 
So this is a primary health care facility. It is in no way a state government facility, which means it is a federal government responsibility because it is fund okay. funded through the Medicare system like right. GPs Okay, are. so when we get to health funding, which will no doubt be an issue at the next uh, during the next term of parliament, if you're sitting around the decision-making table and caucus and Labor, what would you be pushing for? Would you be pushing for an Albanese government to talk to Palaszczuk and come up with a, a plan to fund health 50-50 into the future? Well, just before I turn to the issue of 50-50 health funding, just on that urgent care clinic at the Moriford Health Hub, because this is a really important issue mm. for locals in our area. The fact it has had to close means that now instead of being able to go to that local health facility and be seen really quickly, instead locals would generally have to yeah. go to the Kabucha Hospital Emergency Department where they will have to wait hours and okay. it will put even more pressure on the hospital. So Labor has committed that we will deliver the funding they need to reopen the urgent care clinic at the Morrisville okay, Health Hub. So let's Hub. talk about 50-50. Well, Anthony Albanese has talked uh, about the fact that he will work constructively with the state premiers and chief ministers and they will work together on health funding and this is a really different mm. approach. Working constructively doesn't deliver though, so what is it? If you're worried about dollars and cents, is it something that you'll be pushing for, 50-50 funding? Well, this is a really important difference between mm. Anthony Albanese and Scott Morrison. Anthony Albanese will work constructively with the state premiers on health funding. Whereas what we see from Scott Morrison is he never takes responsibility and he just wants to pick political fights. When we saw last year that every single state requested more health funding from the Morrison government, they singled out Anastasia Palaszczuk to attack her. So we need a Prime Minister who is going to work together with people mm. to find solutions to these really big problems. The Queensland budget's in much better shape than the federal uh, budget, so shouldn't there be a... Should it be a 50-50 split, or does the budget dictate perhaps a, a different split? Well, Anthony Albanese has made it really clear that he is going to work with the premiers on these issues. Okay. And what's really important to our health system is that all parts of it are being properly funded. So he's likely to acquiesce to those demands, is what well, you're if, saying. If I can just finish my point, it's yeah. really important that the whole health system is being properly funded mm -hmm. because the failure of this LNP government and Scott Morrison to properly invest in GPs and primary health care services is mean that locals in our area okay. aren't getting the best health outcomes but it's also putting more pressure on the hospital system and we actually know it's in the best interest of everyone including taxpayers that people can get in to see a GP when they need to that people can go okay. to a local urgent care clinic when they need to rather than going to an emergency department where it is so much more expensive to provide patient mm. care there. Terry the, the picture you're presenting is that it's it's all good here in Longwood when it comes never, to I'll, access to healthcare, but do you think that's the lived experience? Look I, look, I do. Look, is it perfect? No. But I tell you what, it's a lot better than it was now having the DPA status that I've managed to achieve. Yeah. So, can I just say a couple of points there? First of all, the LNP government did not take away DPA status. That is a, done by government, it is not done by politicians or a party. That is simply untrue. Okay? They do it. Uh, as far as funding goes, remember that constitutionally, we give the states money for health, for education, for infrastructure, and they determine how that money is spent. That's yeah. how the constitution works. And, and health funding in this country is at record levels. It's not a matter of funding. It's a matter of how the money is managed at a state level. And is now, it mismanaged, are you saying? Well, all I can go is on Where's the, the evidence all, of that? All I can go is on the outcome. So under the last LNP state government, the ambulance ramping times were lower, the outcomes were better, and yet the funding was lower. So there's proof that just giving more money to a state government, unless it's managed properly, doesn't fix anything. The other thing to do with Medicare is that Medicare funding in Longman has increased from, not, from $120 million to $210 million. Yeah. So again, Medicare funding has not been cut. It <laughs> is at its highest level. Now, I just want to speak on the urgent care clinic at Morayfield. Because I'm a layman. I'm not a health expert. I'm not a doctor. OK? But I try and use some common sense. Mm. Now, when the state government hospital at Caboolture, we know that it's always had struggles as far as ED waiting times and things like that. So when I was first selected, I met, I met with the people down at the Morrowfield Health, Health Hub and they explained to me that the state government was funding them, because that's their job, to fund health care. That, that's part of the constitution. They were funding it to the tune of $20,000 a okay. month. 
he was able to operate under that guise. Then last September, uh, he rang me and said, the state government's cut the funding, mm. right? So I wrote to the, the state health minister, Yvette Darth, expressed yep. my concerns and said, look, to me, it seems like a good thing. Why have you cut the funding? She responded in a letter to me in January and said, um, after a report from Del Deloitte was received, because it was a two year trial, mm -hmm. they did a report, they got that report from Deloitte and based on that information in that report, they, they deemed it not viable and cut the funding. So my question okay. would be, why would federal labour fund something that the state labour government has deemed is not viable and not value for money? It just seems strange to me. Uh, so I then went to Greg Hunt and said, look, it still seems like a good thing to me. So we bought out what's called a MERS grant. So we've said uh, we want to look at urgent health care around the country. Yep. So we've invested $24 million and we put that out there to tender. Again, a body separate to government mm. went through the tender process, assessed all the placements. There's 10 around the country. The urgent care clinic at Morayfield applied for that funding and the report came back, this is unviable. So again, why would we be funding something that we now have a state Labor government report and a federal government report that says that this, this facility mm. is unfundable for whatever reason? Right, so thank you for laying all of that <laughs> out, but we know why there's a bit of fertile ground here. Labor nearly won this seat at the last sure. election because of the Medi-Scare campaign. What's the deal? Medicare state, there'll be no cuts. Can Absolutely you guarantee not. that? Medicare, look, yeah. we've said that all along. Yeah. Th these are just fabrications. Medicare funding has gone up and up now. There's been restructures within Medicare on how things are funded, yep. but the overall funding has gone up. And I'd like to add that we got that, we got that advice from the AMA and other health organisations. Yep. It wasn't us that decided it. We went on their recommendations and implemented all their recommendations. Okay. Rebecca, do you accept that? No more Medi-Scare campaign in, in this election? Well, you couldn't have a clearer example of the fact that the Morrison government refuses to take responsibility for these big issues affecting our community. Mm. The funding of GPs and primary health care is a federal government responsibility. They are funded through the Medicare system. And you have just clearly heard that if Scott Morrison is re-elected, they will not deliver the funding needed to reopen the urgent care clinic at the moment. You won't guarantee Hub. it either, to be fair. Pa sorry? Have you, has Labor guaranteed it? Yes. Labor has made a rock-solid commitment. We will deliver the funding needed to reopen the urgent care clinic right. at the Morayfield Health And Hub. how many nurses will you need for that? Well, this is another issue that goes to the fact that, they're, like with aged care, there are people who have these skills and they often go and work in other sectors. Mm. But so how many? I mean, how many for this urgent care clinic? Do you know how many staff were required last time? Would it be the same this time or more? Well, I've met people door knocking who used to work at the Morayfield Health Hub who don't mm. anymore and they are so pleased that Labor has committed that we will reopen the urgent care clinic if we are, re if we are re elected. Sorry, if we are elected. So I know talking to people, there are people with these skills, mm. with nursing skills, who will be available to take up these jobs if delay, Labor is elected and we deliver the funding. Okay. So there's that short-term opportunities, but Labor also has that medium and long-term plan to train more people with our fee-free TAFE plan. And that's why it's so important. You, under Scott Morrison, they only have a plan to get through the election. Labor has a plan for the medium and long term as well. Well, let's, while we're on scare campaigns, let's just bust a few myths if we can uh, today. Rebecca, I'll start with you. A lot of pensioners have been worried about this spectre of a, a cashless welfare card. Do you accept that the government has no plan to put that forward? I make absolutely no apologies for highlighting this issue and fighting on behalf of the people in our community. It was Scott Morrison and Anne Rustin, as Social Services Minister, who said that they wanted to apply the card more broadly. And if they don't want to do that, then they should announce that they are going to scrap it. Only Labor has committed to scrapping the privatised cashless welfare card if we are elected. The privatised cashless welfare card? What do you mean by that? Well, it's run by a private company, by Inju. They make the decisions about which businesses people can and can't spend their money at. And I've heard from so many local families who are... Who makes the decisions? A private company, not the government. 
Well, a private company with right, the government... They don't make the decision, so do you accept that? Well, that's right. It's the government who is sanctioning all mm. this. It's the Morrison government who supports all of it. They have already put local businesses on the list of places where is people... Is that true, Terry? So let's get... I think we should go back on this because it needs to be explained because we need context, which is a good thing. So uh, it was introduced in four areas around Australia, WA, South Australia, uh, Harvey Bay and Queensland, and it was at the behest of the, of the community that wanted that. It's for uh, youth under 35 uh, in particular circumstances. So it doesn't apply to everyone. And the whole idea of the scheme is to get people job ready. Hmm. Now, last time I checked, we weren't trying to get people on the age pension job ready. Has there ever been a proposal put to you? Never. In my three about... years in Parliament, we have never spoken because right. it doesn't make any sense. Where does this come from then? I have no idea. Rebecca? Well, I'd like to make a couple of points. Firstly, it's Liberal MPs themselves who have raised their... Never about the pension, though. Do you accept that? Pardon? Sorry. Never about the pension, though. Do you accept that? They have raised concerns about the further expansion of the cashless they welfare card. They never said card. pension, though. Do you accept that? Well, it was Anne Rustin, as Social Services Minister, yeah. who said that she wanted to have a, further, a conversation with the nation about the further use of the cashless debit card as a welfare But are measure. you extrapolating Scott that to mean Mo pensioners rather than her saying that? Scott Morrison is on the public record as saying that he considers the age pension to be a welfare measure. And I would add that there are already local families in our community who are being hurt by this cashless welfare card. Do you accept that the age pension is a welfare measure? Uh, I don't agree with what Scott Morrison said when he said that. But the age pension is a welfare measure? It was Scott Morrison who said that he considers the age pension to be a welfare measure. Okay, well, what's and I wrong know... with that statement, though? I know that's really offensive to a lot of age pensioners who worked really hard, paid their taxes, and they don't like the fact that Scott Morrison describes it as welfare. But I'd like to well, make what the... should it be described as, do you think? Well, I'd like to make the point that I have spoken to local families who are already being hurt by the cashless welfare card. I've spoken to people who've had a baby and under this cashless welfare card, they can't buy cheap second-hand furniture that they're not even going to need in a few years. Mm. They can't buy cheap goods in, online. They have to buy brand new products. In your electorate? That's correct, because there were... How many people are on the cashless welfare card in, in Longman? Well, the government, you'd have to ask the government for those statistics, but there were trial sites... I don't sites. think it's been rolled out here, though. Correct. Is there were trial... Right? There were trial sites and people have moved. So okay, people sorry, who originally... let's just get some facts here. Is the cashless welfare card in this electorate? It already is with certain families because they lived in trial sites when it was introduced. Right, but and they here. have now okay. moved to Caboolture and other areas. So I meet them at the markets. Um, I'm at the Caboolture markets every Sunday and I'm speaking to these local families with young kids who talk about the fact that, you know, they had to buy brand new things from big chain stores and also about the fact that on the cashless welfare card can't buy fresh food and veg at the, at the markets but they can buy the stuff you have at, at the big name supermarkets. Mm. So this card is not good for families and there are people yeah. who are living in our community right now who are on the card. Yeah. It, it, right now on the card but it's not being rolled out in this electorate. So they lived in the trial sites when it was introduced. They have now moved to our region. They are not taken off the card when they are moved into our region. So they are on So it. how many people are we talking? You would have to ask the government for those statistics. I just know... But you're I... the one raising it as an issue, yeah. so... Well, I know from what I hear from locals when I talk to them at the Caboolture Markets or my listening posts or when so I... So are you talk... talking about one family that's raised this or has it been multiple times? I've had multiple people raise this as an issue. Okay. Terry, has that been raised with you? No, never. Because we just don't have people here on the card. Okay. As I say, it's for particular communities. And I'd like to say that 20% of the card still comes through in a bank account, so it's not the entire... Uh, payment. Uh, the other thing is, is that if someone wants to go and buy a second-hand fridge, they're able to go down. They're allowed, able to apply for a cash advance on the card, or get, and that's approved. Right. So you know, people can 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 use that. And look, people have actually. I've talked to other members who have the trial, and they've said some people don't like it. We understand that, but there are other people who were against it to start with. who are actually thanking them now and saying, look, it's helped me budget. But do so, you guarantee that this is not going to be rolled out for the age pension? Absolutely. Okay. My word on it. All right, let's talk religious freedom now because this has been an issue in the, the teal seats, uh, of course, around Victoria uh, and New South Wales. Mm. There are no teal candidates in Queensland, but there certainly seems to be some uh, teal issues. So, Terry, do you think those moderates are hurting your chances in this seat? 
Uh, look, I don't know. I think... No, I, I, I don't. I think... Um, I, I do believe in the bill and, and, and the concept of the bill and, and, I, and I believe in the heart of the bill and I think what we need to do is there needs to be some, some debate on it because I want to see that everyone is fairly treated. Uh, but we've got to also remember there are the rights of those families who decide to put their children in a school and expect a certain standard. What or a are certain... those rights? That they shouldn't be taught by a, a gay teacher or have fellow gay students? Well, look, it, that would depend on the school and their statement of faith. You're talking about expelling gay students? I'm not talking about expelling anyone. Or teachers? I'm not talking about expelling anyone. What are you talking about? I'm then? talking about the fact that not only do the rights of the people need to be, but the rights of the people... Not, I'm not only talking about the rights of the people who may be going through those situations. I'm talking about the school's right to be able to employ people that yeah. go along with their own faith. Like, if I'm going to employ a butcher and I'm in a butcher shop, I want a butcher. So if someone's going to employ someone in a faith-based school, they want someone of their faith, and I don't think that's unreasonable. There are gay Christians, you know. Yeah, sure. So what's wrong with that? Well, that's up to the school to decide. That's what I'm saying. This is not a matter for governments. It's up to the schools. And, and well, the... it is made a matter for government because Scott Morrison has put it on the table once again on this election campaign. You were yeah. very critical of moderates across the floor on, on this. Why? Well, because, number one, it was an election promise. And also, I think when you're a part of a team and you're part of a party, there is, there's robust de debate in the party room. But I believe in unity as a party. And then once we've made a decision as a party, there's some things that I might not agree with 100% that we go out with, but at the end of the day, I am part of a party. If I don't want to do that, I should be an independent. Sure. So there's no issues that you're really passionate about on behalf of your electorate that you would be willing to cross the floor on? Is that what uh, you're saying? Well, normally those sort of issues are brought up as a conscience vote mm. and you are able to what cross the floor What are those issues those. for you? Oh, there's only been one so far, and that was the mitochondrial bill, uh, but I haven't had any other conscience debate, uh, conscience vote, so I can't say. It, I would take that as it comes. OK, Rebecca, on this issue, where do you stand and what protections would you like to see or otherwise? Well, Labor believes all Australians should be able to live their life free from discrimination, and that includes people of faith. And that's why an Albanese Labor government would act to prevent discrimination against people of faith, including by introducing uh, religious anti-vilification protections. OK, what does that mean? Is there a, a unintended consequences for students? of four teachers who happen to be gay? Well, Labor would act to prevent discrimination against students on any grounds, mm. and we would prevent discrimination against teachers in the workplace while maintaining the right of religious girls to preference people of their own faith when making hiring decisions. Well, how would you do that? Well, Labor set out our clear, united plan on this, and this is in contrast to what we've seen from the Morrison government, where this is yet another issue where they are deeply divided. Is that true? Deeply divided? No. Broad church? No. We're not deeply divided. We have we have different point of view and that's healthy. We have, And as I say, we have robust... Well, it's not healthy because you couldn't uh, maintain an election promise. Well, it, it, it had to get through the Senate as well after the lower house, didn't it? So, yeah. yeah. So, well, and, and, and as I say, I'm into having the debate. But, you know, COVID came along and it got pushed back and got pushed back and unfortunately we ran out of time. Well, what about the debate that's come up with Catherine Deves, your candidate in uh, the seat of Warringah? Do you agree with her views? Look, I think she, I, look, I respect her views. I'm not going to. I'm not going to put my own personal views out there. I respect her views on on what she says. Um, as far as you're talking about, as far as transgenders in sport, is that, sport? Is that the particular? Sure. Uh, yesterday, the, the prime minister raised the issue that he said he was quote very concerned about, and that's gender reassignment surgery. Why should government be involved in that at all? Well, that's the prime minister's views. But as far as transgender, what's goes, your view on it? On, on transgender, on, trans yeah, gender, gender surgery? reassignment surgery. I mean, it's never happened. Here well, in Australia. at the end of the day, that's a, that's a choice of an individual, and that's the beauty of living in a democracy. That's right. Why is yeah. government getting involved? What well, what, no, this, the, the point is here is is that we've got parents of daughters who are concerned that they are going to be sharing a dressing room with someone who used to be a male, uh, and also competing against those people and getting an unfair advantage. And look, I, I, I support them in that. I don't think that we Has should. Has that ever come up? Yes. As an issue? Yes. Tell us about that. A couple that. of times, not many. Yeah. It's, it's not it a major with? issue. How was it dealt with? As far as the government goes? Or well, community, was it dealt with by government or was it dealt with in well, the Well, one community? example I can think of was at a golf club. We had, uh, there was a, uh, the, the, the ladies' committee got very upset because there was a, someone who, who, who transgendered over and, and was hitting the ball further and winning all the competitions and they weren't terribly happy about it, but they just lived with it. But they weren't happy about it. Right, so the competition went on? 
Yeah, it did. The sun came up the next day. It did, it did. But, but you know, you're at, the end, at the end of the day, fair. we're talking about a social competition here. We're not yeah. talking about, and, you know, and when you get to the elite level and things like that, I think that's an issue as well. Rebecca, what do you do about that? It's unfair. That's the way your constituents would see it, wouldn't they? Mm. Well, I think it's about letting the experts on these issues determine what's fairest for everyone. Um, but to be honest, I'm really focused on those issues that locals are raising with me and what they're raising with me is skyrocketing cost of living, real wages going backwards, the fact we have an aged care crisis in our country and the fact that locals can't get good local health care when they need it. So okay. these are the big issues affecting our All region. Right, we'll get to that in the closing statements, but we've got about three minutes until you have your closing statements. So let me get a few more questions in. Uh, Terry, Scott Morrison seems deeply unpopular at the moment um, across the country personally, uh, but people aren't quite sure about Anthony Albanese. How close is this seat and how unpopular do you think Scott Morrison is here S compared to three years ago? Oh, look, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I get very few negative comments. You always get a few negative comments, but I don't think I've seen a rise in that over the past three years. Um, you're always going to get disgruntled people, that's, that's for sure. But, yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, the Prime Minister, they've admired him for the fact that he's led us through a very tough time. You know, we've gone through fires, we've gone through a pandemic, mm. we've gone through floods. And, again, we manage the economic side of the recovery. The states are the ones who deliver the mandates as far as health goes. We had yeah. no jurisdiction over that. And that's one thing I think the Australian people have learnt in the pandemic is a lot more about the Constitution because, you know, they wanted, the, they wanted the federal government to step in and lead on all these areas. And, in fact, one of the comments I get is that a lot of people felt like we were living in eight countries, you know, sure. six states and two, and two territories. And they wanted one unified country. And I think, to his credit, the Prime Minister, with the best intentions, put together a national cabinet yeah. with the hope that people could put politics aside for the greater good. And some people said that was naive and it, was a, it wasn't a great move, but hey, if it means being naive and, and not a great move, believing the best in people, sign me up. Uh, Rebecca, that's a good point. The COVID situation, the pandemic hasn't gone away. We're in a bit of a lull now. But if there was a, a new spike uh, and thousands of more cases, what should uh, governments of either stripe what should they consider? Is it now only solely based on the health advice, considering we're a highly vaccinated population? Well, I think governments always need to listen to the experts and act on the health advice and listen... Economic and or health experts? Well, we need to listen to the health experts to make sure that we look after people's health because you can't have a strong economy if people aren't healthy and can go to work. That's what we saw during the pandemic. And I hear from so many people in our region who are frustrated at the fact that Scott Morrison never takes responsibility. He never admits his failures and he's always trying to blame someone else. And we okay. saw that constantly throughout the pandemic. We saw it on the vaccine rollout and on his failures with rapid antigen tests. What has Anastasia and Palaszczuk taken responsibility for in the pandemic? Well, it, as I mentioned earlier, it was Anastasia Palaszczuk's tough decisions on the borders mm. that helped protect Queenslanders and made okay. sure we protected our lives and our livelihoods and our community can't afford mm. three more years of a Prime Minister okay. who is always just looking to blame others and is never taking responsibility for these big issues okay. that are affecting our community. Just quickly, on net zero, the Teal Independents in the southern states want a more ambitious target. Do you think Labor, if they're in a minority government situation, should negotiate and would you be open to a higher target? Well, Labor has made our position on our energy policy very clear. Is that no? Labor has made our energy policy very clear and we are united in that in contrast to the division we see under Scott Morrison and the LNP government. Mm. And it's this LNP government's failures on energy policy that have okay. held our country back. Labor's policy will mean more jobs, particularly in places like re regional Queensland. It will cut emissions and it will also mean cheaper power. And that's why Labor's plan is supported okay. by the Business Council of Australia, Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian right. Industry Group and the National Farmers Federation. OK, we are out of time. Terry, your final 30 seconds. OK. Well, thanks, everyone. It's been a pleasure to be here today. And I hope you've seen from today that, you know, if, if you're voting for me, you're just going to get someone who just wants to get things done for the community. We've achieved so much, $5 million worth of funding for the PCYC here locally, uh, roads, $660 million for the third lane on the Bruce Highway, the overpass down at Narangbar. We've looked after the GP shortage and made sure we've got that DPA status back. Uh, so cost of living is being eased by the fact that we've uh, 
letting you keep more of what you earn, as well as the fuel excise cut. So good news, strong economy means a strong country. Rebecca. Thanks, Laura. Under Scott Morrison, everything is going up except people's wages. For nearly a decade, this LNP government have let the people of Longman fall further and further behind. Enough is enough. Only Labor has a plan to ease cost of living pressures, deliver secure, well-paid jobs, make sure people can see a GP and fix the crisis in aged care. This can only happen if we elect an Albanese Labor government and that's why I'm asking for the people of Longman's support to deliver a better future for our community. Rebecca Fanning, we thank you. Terry Young, we thank you both for your Thanks, time Terry. today. As we promised, there was 45 minutes of a pretty fierce debate that went back and forth. This is a contest of ideas. There are competing interests in this seat of Longman. It is one of the most marginal seats in Queensland and it's one that you need to keep an eye on, probably late on election night. This is a margin of just 3.3% here. Keep your eye on it. We'll see you soon.